Well, uh, let me give a little bit of an advertisement for, for next weekend. Uh, within the unique series, we are going to have a message that's going to center around prayer. It will make sense uh, as you get here for that. But uh, on that weekend, we're going to talk about uh, 21 dangerous prayers. And we have this little devotional book that we're going to make available next weekend. We'll be out here at the source table. Uh, they are free. Uh, I've had a number of people that are part of our church will go, hey, we like to carry our own uh, water, so to speak, and uh, we don't mind uh, paying for things like that. Listen, uh, they're about three bucks is what they cost the church. If you want to put three bucks on the table, but there's not going to be anything for sale. Just know you can drop some money and help uh, pay for them if you'd like to. Uh, free to our church. Little booklet. It just walks you through how to pray dangerous prayers. Most people, their prayer life is something like this. God bless me. God protect me. God watch over everybody I love and keep me safe. Those are not dangerous prayers. And uh, we want to look about how to pray dangerous prayers this year. So, We'll have that message next weekend. Pick the book up, and then on that Monday, we'll start 21 days, take us all the way to the end of the month. Uh, I'm mainly saying this for our life groups, life group leaders. This will be your material as well as you meet, along with some of the things out of, uh, out of the messages. So uh, into the unique uh, series we go, and if you'll notice, we're going to take up uh, this passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, uh, I think are some key, very key uh, verses that are in the Bible. Again, if you're in a life group, I want you guys to put this verse under a microscope, and we kind of give you a guide uh, to go to when you meet this week or the next time that you meet. And if you're not in a life group, uh, you can find out all about that uh, again on that QR code and just another advertisement. Hey, this maybe that's the next best step in your life is now move into a life group where we do so much more than just what you get here in these messages. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. If you're focused there on the screen or the Bible in your lap and you're ready to go, say amen. amen. All right. So God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. That one line right there is contrary to what most of the world believes about the hereafter. Most of the world, even in the Christian West, thinks if you're going to go to heaven, it's going to be because your good outweighed your bad. And in the middle of that, here is something contrary uh, the Word of God throws into that philosophy. If you're going to heaven, it's not going to be because of what you've done. It's going to be because you've received a gift. The gift. It happened when you did what? When you believed. Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. Think about that for a moment. You're a masterpiece. A lot of translations say his workmanship. God has crafted you and all that's gone on into you and in your life for his glory. You are his masterpiece, his workmanship. He has created a new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us. How long ago? <laughs> long ago. Long ago. He planned this for your life. How long ago was it? Before time before time created anew changed us so we can do what he has designed us to do the idea is God has a dream for your life he has something in mind for you and what a wonderful time of the year in this new year at the threshold of a new year to hit a reset button and ask ourselves that important question am I becoming the person God dreamed I would become you may recall in your junior high or high school days studying about DNA. DNA, deroxobinucleic acid. So we'll just call it DNA, amen? <laughs> everybody or every body has two strands in every cell of your body. Genetic material, one from your father, one from your mother. Most of us had to pass that on a test to get out of somewhere along the ninth or 10th grade. 
So we have this genetic code, this genetic two strands that are in our symbols here behind us, the uh, helix, if you will, and every person has a, a unique one. In other words, there's not another one like me, not another one like you. There are seven billion people on the planet plus right now, and not two people are exactly alike. Every now and again, you see somebody who looks like somebody you know, and sometimes we'll even stop them, and you know, <laughs> well, you look like somebody I know. And the, you know the word for that's doppelganger, doppelganger. And uh, wasn't it sad that somebody would just look like us, right? But every now and then you, you find someone that looks like you or looks like someone you know, but they're not like you. They're not from the, the same family, and certainly there's a whole different set of DNA and a whole different set of genetic code that is in them. They, it's just expressed in a way that looks similar. So in reality, we do not see the actual DNA of our bodies or of our lives unless you get your cells under a microscope and really a powerful microscope to get all the way down to see that DNA code that is in us. So we don't see the DNA. We see, as we look at one another, the expression of that DNA, and that expression of the DNA is found in our appearances and in our mannerisms. It is, in fact, who we are, and it is, in fact, defined by what we do. In the same way, we here at Grace Fellowship Church, our family, as a church family, is expressed to the world around us because of the unique DNA that we have when God puts us all together. Each of us becomes, as you become a part of our church or any local church, hear what I'm about to tell you now, your presence here is for better or for worse. How about that? Right out of the gate, a hard one, right? Your presence in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ in a local assembly will either be for better or it will be for worse to that whole body. Now, this leads me to say the church is an organism and there's a misunderstanding that is in the world today that the church is an organization. The church is the Lord Jesus Christ's body. It is an organism. It is alive. It is breathing. It is moving. And it is about, it is more than an organization, if you will. So again, one of the great misunderstandings is the church is first an organization. It's not even a half truth. It's barely a truth. Someone said, well, I don't like organized religion. You'll fit in perfect here because we're rarely organized. Amen? But what we are is an organism. We are definitely that. Sometimes the organization falls in a little bit behind us where we'd like it to be occasionally, but we are first and foremost an organism, the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the scriptures tell us about the local assembly uh, uh, of the church. So he's using us as a unique expression of himself to the world, to our community that looks on to be a witness of his very existence and a witness of his truth. The church is the most powerful organism on earth when God is leading it. Careful, let me say it again. It is the most powerful organism on the earth when God is leading it. Every church, like every individual, is unique because we are all uniquely different. How could any two churches be alike when we are all different who come and make it up? I always thought it was funny. We'd go to, and I, nothing wrong with church conferences. I enjoy going to a church conference and learn what other churches are doing. But I would see friends of mine, uh, you know, they would go to a church out in Colorado or out in California or up in, uh, you know, Philadelphia or somewhere. And it's a great church doing something wonderful. And they'd come back and try to make their church exactly like that. How futile is that? We're not exactly alike. Therefore, you cannot replicate what one church is doing. You might gain some ideas, but the idea is God is giving us a particular vision and particular assignments because we are uniquely different than any other church on the planet right now. What a fabulous thought that is, even if I thought it. 
So think of it for just a moment. In this series, what we want to do is explore the unique DNA that God has given us. What makes Grace Fellowship Church unique? What is it that Grace Fellowship Church is really about? See, if we're His body, please understand He's the head. Right? He's the head. And there are certain aspects of church life that should look the same in most all churches. And if we're following Him, there will be a pattern that is set. But it will be uniquely expressed through us in our unique gifts and talents as we come together. I can, I, through this series, we'll keep going back to the body and keep going back to the science. And there's a reason for that because if you'll understand the science, you'll understand better the Creator and you'll understand that there's nothing that separates in this world the physical from the spiritual except our opinions. God intended everything physical to be an example of the spiritual. So in your body, though this number is debatable, I think you at least get the idea here, there are 37.2 trillion cells in your body. 37.2 trillion. So if you're off a few billion, well, again, that's debatable, but 37.2 trillion. Most of us in our finite minds, unless you are a math wizard, have a very hard time getting a handle on even what a trillion is. If you marked it in time and said, we're going to go back one trillion seconds in time, you would go back 30,000 B.C. from right now. And, and by the way, you're jumping over a lot of creation science, of which I don't mean to do. I'm just giving it an element for you to think about. One trillion in time in seconds moves you back to 30,000 B.C. There are 37.2 trillion cells in your body. We'll reference this as we go through uh, this series a few times about what all that that means, but I want you to understand this. All of those cells, 37.2 trillion cells in your body must work together for you even to stand up or to sit down or to drive a car or to do anything that you're doing, to just look around, to move around, do all that. They cannot be, your cells cannot be selfish little microbes and it all work out in, in your functions. So how do our cells know what to do? Well, I know there's a head sitting on top of this body. In the same way with the church I just mentioned, we are His body. He is the, the head of that. But watch now, in the supernatural genius of our Creator, those cells are infused with a very complex roadmap that looks like that. That, that helix right there, that, that is a road map. It is a blueprint of our DNA. And these instructions are given on that DNA for every cell, for it to, how to behave and what to do and how to keep orders and how to work together and to move in the same direction, accomplishing the greater purpose and design. And the instructions that it's giving us are incredibly detailed and very determinative. So we're going to be gazing within these cells of our congregation, if you will, and examining those things that God has given us a little bit under the microscope. Uh, I believe strongly that God has a unique mission and place for Grace Fellowship Church, not just in our community, but in our world. In a sense, if you're more of a blue-collar person than a scientist, we're going to lift the hood on the truck and look in. All right? With what is the expression of this church in our values and our mission and our strategy? What makes us tick? Why do we do what we do here at Grace Fellowship Church? And by the way, we have to answer that continually because God sends new people here into, into this church and we're not becoming more of what the community is. We're becoming, we want the community to become more of what God has designed us to be. Do you understand that? So we have to know who we are and where we're going so we can help give instruction for people to come in lest we get divided and forget why we're here and what our mission is and what the vision is and moving forward uh, into that. So I want to say again, the church is an organism first. It is an organism that began first, uh, not just, uh, please understand this, our church didn't just begin 12 years ago. No church has 
has a start date in relevance of time, if it is a church of Jesus Christ, do you know where this church started? In the heart of God before eternity. Eternity past. Think of that. When did Grace Fellowship Church, sometimes people ask me that. Oh, it was 12, 12 years ago. I know what they're saying, but please understand, it began in the heart of God. The church itself, as you talk about it, the universal church, as it's like to be called, well, did it start when Jesus called the first disciples? Did it start on the day of Pentecost? You can debate both of those things, but let me just give you the, the greater answer for that. It started in the heart of God before God created Eden, before he put the, hung the stars, before the first man was created, the church began in the heart of God. So it is more than an organization. It is an organism. His desire is to imprint. Watch this. His desire is to imprint his image in us as we represent him and his kingdom. That's what we're to do. A great many churches have never known this or understood this. A great many church leaders don't get this either, and they wonder why no one comes to their meetings. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why don't people come to our meetings or attend our organization? It almost answers itself because meetings are boring. Amen? Amen? Who wants to sit through a meet? You want to see people's hearts sink? Talk about the, oh, we got to go down to the school because the school board is having this meet. It's the parent-teacher meeting. Right? Oh, we got we're, we're part of this organization, and we have to meet and go turn in our minutes. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Has anybody got anything good for the order? Some of y'all been to that meeting, haven't you? And in that meeting, nothing happens of any real value. It's pointless. No lives are changed. Nothing great is happening. Nothing is solved. And they say, well, I know where some of our meetings have things like that. I'll give you that. But I'm talking about put this in the context of church. If we're just going to have a meeting today, I'd rather just do something else. And I'm sure you would. Meetings are boring. Organizational things are boring. But it's not so with a living, breathing organism that exists to express the very life and breath of Jesus Christ. In a gathering where it's an organism of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, when that's over, there is life that's felt. And there is change that has happened. And there is vision that is cast. And there is hope that is created in the hearts of people. And the trajectory of people's lives begins to change. And people begin to change. And there is a place that you come into that uh, somewhere along the way it becomes full of joy because there's life in that organization. And then you want to come in because you enjoy serving one another and loving one another. And it's a blessing just to see one another because you realize, hey, we're a part of the same body. Body, and we're going the same direction and we're fighting the same fight and in for the same cause and all that. We're willing to make sacrifices to sustain that body and that life and move it generationally forward. The church is called out, is a called out body of people saved by grace who understand they are God's masterpiece. They understand that they're God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus carrying out a plan that was given and formed in God's heart and mind a long, long time ago. Further back than any of us can get our, our minds on. And listen, it's just in our blood when we come together and we understand who we are and what we're doing as a church. So today I just want to simply examine one element that must be a prominent part of of church life. It must be a prominent part of church life, meaning it must be a part of your life and my life, and collectively together uh, we must have this. You see, all cells must have nutrition to survive. Every living thing eats, including the church. Every living thing eats, including the church. 
As we begin this new year, for most people, it is once again time to make some resolutions. And the most popular of those resolutions, ironically, is I got to quit eating. <laughs> right? It'd been wonderful if we had just enough vision before Thanksgiving to have come up with that idea. <laughs> right? Before we gorged ourselves for weeks and called it the holidays. And then New Year's rolls around and we go, man, I got great regret. <laughs> great regret. I resolve I need to lose some weight. I would say, and all the surveys say, the most popular goal, in all, uh, uh, the most popular resolution is to be more healthy this year and to lose weight. Now let me hone in on this thought. God wants you to be healthy spiritually. The church, His body, cannot be healthy without you and I being spiritually healthy. This church is no more healthy than you and I, spiritually. It can't be. You've heard this all your life. You are what you eat. And my good Lord, when I think about the last few weeks, what a thing I must be, <laughs> right? How many of you going to get honest with me right here? I don't want to think about what I must be from all that I have eaten over the, over the holidays. Man, wow. But it was fun. <laughs> it was so much fun. But now it's got to stop. Or Mac Daddy got to go find some new clothes. All right, so uh, you don't need a science degree to understand this. If you want a healthy body, you have to eat healthy food and drink a lot of clean water, Right? People say, well, I'm starting a new diet. Does it involve healthy food and clean water and exercise? And if it don't, my goodness, what are you doing? You don't need a degree in nutrition to understand that. It's as, it's as old as time. So in the same way, spiritually, you're going to have to eat some certain things. And you're going to have to consume some certain things for you to be spiritually healthy. If you physically don't eat well, your body is going to break down. Spiritually, if you're not going to eat well, your spirit and soul is going to break down. Listen to what the scriptures say about themselves. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. Stop right there. The word of God is alive and powerful. The Word of God is an organism. It is alive. It is powerful. Most people just breeze right by that and never give it a moment's thought. The Word of God is alive and powerful. All together now. The Word of God is alive and powerful. So what does it do? It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit. Now, we're talking about a scalpel now. We're talking about surgery. Between joint and marrow. Tell me what's deeper than the bone marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So the Word of God, again, is alive and powerful, and it's able to do surgery on us, fixing what's wrong with us if we would take it and consume it into our life. In John's Gospel, in chapter 6, we understand Jesus and I reference these passages all the time in our church because they're so key and they're so important. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, right? In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus says, I am the Word, capital W, a person. The Word of God is, is synonymous with His very life. The Word of God is, is Jesus. You're consuming Him when you're consuming the Word of God. How much more spiritual health could you have than just doing that? So you're taking that word, putting it in your being, and listen to further illustrate the point. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness before he started his ministry by Satan himself, in Matthew 4 and verse 4, he is simply answering Satan what is written in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, 
when he's so hungry, he's fasted 40 days, Satan comes to him and says, well, you're, you're the son of God. Turn those rocks into bread. In other words, act independently and not follow the Lord's will precisely in your life. And he answers that by just simply saying, no, no, we're not going to do that. No. Man, we need to learn that. No, Satan. The scriptures say people do not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What do we live on? Just bread? Spiritually, we're to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God that has been preserved in a book. It's life to me and life to you, as we just sang about a moment ago. Life and health for the Christian is found on feeding on the Word of God. In reference to the wisdom that is found in this, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 8, it shall be health to thy navel and mara to thy bones. My goodness, a navel where we were connected to our mother, this very source of life that is coming into us. And again, what's deeper than the marrow of, of your bones? I had a stem cell transplant. You guys know about that. That is the marrow being changed out of my bones. There's nothing deeper in your life. I was sick with cancer in the very marrow of my bones, and it took healthy cells to be a transplant, to have them, one, one group killed off and another group to be brought in, and that cured cancer. It is the same with the Word of God. I have things operating in me all the time because of my sinful bent in life, as you would, and I must have the Word of God to come in and literally kill that off, cut that out, and resupply me with life. Or I walk around a cancerous being and bring that nonsense junk to church with me and infect everybody around me. How many of you have ate already today? It's not a trick question. Come on now. You had breakfast. How many are you going to eat at least one more time today? How many are going to eat two more times? <laughs> right? Well, it's, you know, we'll start the resolution next week. Right? We are going to eat. We're planning on it. If you don't eat, listen, if you don't eat till next Sunday, now, that's wonderful if you're fasting for spiritual purposes, but I'll tell you what happens to me when I don't eat. The first thing that happens to me is I get mad. I get hungry and I get angry, and we call that what? Hangry, right? We all know what hangry is, and then you know what? I'm not pleasant to be around. I'm short. I don't want to talk to people. I'm just, I'm just a little bit edgy with all that. And by the way, we know who you are. We know who you are spiritually, amen? When you come in the church house hangry, spiritually hangry, nothing makes you happy, nothing pleases you, there's no blessing that you're sharing because you're just spiritually hangry when you walk in. Free of charge, ladies and gentlemen, free of charge. Spiritually speaking, Listen, if all you're going to eat this week is what I'm serving here today, you're going to starve to death. Here's why. Most of you are going to walk out, won't remember, but maybe one thing, if I'm lucky, one thing that I said. You'll walk out. Most of you don't take notes. Most of you don't look at, at further in the Scriptures. Most of you are not in life groups, and you're going to walk out with a little, a little Pop-Tart kind of a thing, even though I've preached the Word of God to you, but you have to be ready to take it in. And then you have to get your Bible open and continue to study what you've heard and be reading all, more about it, and then your spiritual life will grow, and it won't be so hard to make so many of you happy. <laughs> By the way, while I'm on it, it's not my job to make you happy. <laughs> That's your job, right? Right? I'm not in charge of your happiness. And uh, say, Pastor, are we having problems? I don't know. Listen, before God, I don't know of a single problem in our church right now, and I've rarely been able to say that in 30-something years. Usually I know, man, here's something I'm going to have to go deal with. Well, this year, I'm going to have to go deal with this, this person, this thing. I really don't have anything like that. It's just preventative maintenance today. Wouldn't it be good if this would be the year 
that we just focused on his word and went forward as a church and accomplished his mission for us. Wow. All right. One of the single greatest things I can encourage you in today, if not the greatest thing to encourage you, is to come and dine every day of this new year on the Word of God. I mean, that's, that's it. Resolve to do so. Then you can be a healthy Christian, and you will be a healthy addition to our church. A healthy addition. So, well, I've been a part of this church since the beginning. Well, that's wonderful, but are you a healthy part? Are you a healthy part? Let me explain the science of this real quick. DNA has four great functions. I'm only going to give you one of them today. The other ones will just come out as we roll through the series. Replication. That's one of the great functions of DNA. Again, if you understand the science of this, you'll better understand the spiritual realities of this. You have a DNA code. Your DNA replicates itself continually in your body. That's what it's doing over and over again. The same code, same genetic code, the same thing in every cell is being replicated over and over and over again. I put in parentheses at the bottom imaging because most of us can better get a hold of that word because we live in a day where a copy machine is more understand, uh, understood than perhaps the replication of cells. I put a master copy in the copy machine and hit print and we can get as many of them as we need, right? And as long as the color holds out, they'll be exact on a good copier. Correct? Everybody with me? Same could be said. Some of you are photographers. I'm not, I, I, do, I can take one on a phone, right? But a good camera with a good lens, that shutter opens up. It lets light in. Someone taking a picture of someone else can capture that moment is exactly who they are. By the way, how many of you ever got a picture of yourself and go, I don't look like that? right is that me in that moment it was right it's an exact replication an exact image captured in a moment of time imprinted so you can see it you can see it you can hold it up and go is that me oh <laughs> and you start fixing stuff that you feel like is wrong the Word of God is a literary portrait of God Himself. It is the image of God printed in literary form for you to look at, and the Bible says of itself it's also a mirror. We see an image of God and at the same time an image of ourself. We see God and we see what's wrong with us. Amen? And you tell me which one you think should adjust. Right? I see God, I see myself and go, <laughs> I got something on me. I have to fix myself right there. The idea of replication is I spend time in the Word of God and His very image over time is replicated in my very being. In my very being. All of a sudden when I speak, it sounds like I don't mean being a holy Joe and quoting the King James Bible down at work. I'm talking about you begin to answer with the wisdom of the Word of God. You begin to speak in a blessing as opposed to the curse that we live under. The replication of God's Word begins to show up in your family, in your relationships, in the church that you attend, in the life group that you're a part of. Everywhere you go, the question should be, am I adding life or am I bringing death and harm and ugliness and all that kind of stuff. Listen, if we're in the Word of God, that imaging of that should be taking place in our own lives. The very heart of the problem with most Christians and most churches is what I'm talking about. People are feeding on other things besides the Word of God and trying to play church. They're replicating the dead traditions of man-made religion instead of the Word of God. They're replicating popular world ideas. They're replicating their own dead opinions, ideas, and ideals that have been handed down to them. And they say things like, well, my daddy always did this in church, or my mama always said, what about the Word of God? 
Quit replicating what you think and quit replicating your opinion and find out what thus saith the Lord. We replicate business and corporate models of finance and risk management into the church house as opposed to faith and, and being obedient to what God is saying to us in His Word. We replicate popular social changes in the whims of an ever-changing, more wicked-by-the-day culture as opposed to having the image replicated of the never-changing Word of God. One of the greatest rebukes from Jesus in the Gospels to the religious establishment is simply in the phrase we find in Matthew 19, 4. Haven't you read the Scriptures? I won't give you all of them, but let me see if you get the idea that Jesus intended for people to read the Scriptures. Because here's what would happen. The religious people of His day would want to come around and ask Him a question. Most of it is for entrapment. Imagine trying to entrap the Word with your words. Right? Haven't you read the Scriptures? Matthew 21, 13, He said to them, The Scriptures declare, My temple should be called the house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. In other words, you've missed that one. Proverbs 21, 16, They asked Jesus, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied, Haven't you ever read the Scriptures? For they say you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Matthew 21, 42, Then Jesus asked them, Didn't you ever read this in the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. Matthew 22, 29, Jesus replied, Your mistake is that you don't know the Scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. Remember what the, par the, the Word of God is? It's alive and what? Powerful. But you don't know that if you hadn't read that. It's just words on a page. Matthew twenty-two thirty-one. 31, But now, as to whether there will be a resurrection of the dead, haven't you ever read about this in the... Mark 2, verse 25, Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read the Scriptures when David did uh, what he and his companion what he did when they were when they were hungry they were they were busting him about the uh, hey, your disciples they're doing this and that on the Sabbath well haven't you ever read what David did on the Sabbath when they when his followers were were hungry most of our errors and we're, we're just flat out missing the mark as people and thus as a church come from our failure to know and study the Word of God and to let it replicate the very image of God into our very being and existence. Most Christians are weak and sickly in their soul because they've not learned to feed on the Word of God. It's a theme through Scripture. Paul rebuked the church at Corinth in his first letter to them for this very thing in 1 Corinthians 3, and I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as in the spiritual. Paul said, look, in my life, I've moved over here way ahead, and when I, I, I started the church, we left you with the Word of God, but you're still over here as a bunch of babies. I have to speak to you as carnal people, in other words, fleshly people who are not behaving as spiritual people because you're babies in Christ. You know what babies do? They suck bottles and they poop their britches. Amen? And if you read about the church of Corinth, this was a church that sucked the bottle and pooped their britches spiritually all the time. And Paul said, could I just not give you the meat of the Word of God and can we just be mature and go forward? Honest to goodness, so many churches are consumed with dealing with people who, who should have stopped pooping their britches spiritually a long time ago. Right? And making messes for, for everything in church. Spiritual people get to the meat of the Word of God and they don't need a bottle. They don't wake up crying in the night needing attention. They just go get something out of the refrigerator, put it in the stove and eat it. Amen? You have a copy of the Word of God. Preacher, I need some advice. Great, call me. First thing I'm going to ask you, have you read the Scriptures? Do you know what they say about this subject? The writer of Hebrews chapter 5 deals with the same thing. Most people think it's the same Apostle Paul that wrote it, but 
There is much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long that you ought to be teaching others. Can I say this to our congregation? How many years you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ and own a Bible for you can tell somebody else about it? When are you going to be ready to lead a life group? When are you going to be ready to witness to someone? When is it going to happen? How long does it really need to be? Notice in the middle of verse 12, you're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. Here we go again. <laughs> right? For someone who lives on milk is still an infant. Doesn't know what to do, what's right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Lots of people come into church, and it's fine when you're a brand new Christian or you're a person that's searching. You don't know what's right and wrong, and you've come looking for answers, and thank God you're here. If you're 25 years in, <laughs> 10 years in, whatever the case, and you still don't know what's right and wrong in your life, man, I'm going to say you just don't know the Scriptures. And that's on you. My desire is to pastor a group of people at this church that love the Word of God, that love the Word of God, who come in and they hear me speak on something and they go, Pastor, I was just reading about that. I was just looking in my devotions the other day. I was just praying and spending time in the Bible. Man, that helps feed me. I say yes and amen to that. It really restored something in my soul. I want to be a part of a church that honors the Word of God in the church, honors the Word of God in their homes, where they work, where they're in school, people who study the Word of God daily, who search the Scriptures to find that all of them point to Jesus. And therefore, when it imprints upon your heart and your life, we find you pointing everybody to Jesus out of your very actions that are imprinted upon your heart and soul and life. I want to be like the ancient old apostle John one day as I speak about you. We find his words in 3 John beginning there in verse 2. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you, that you are all healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Notice he's got word back from some evangelists that have been to, to this particular uh, body of people. And they're telling John about their faithfulness and all those things. And in verse 4, he says, I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following the truth. That's what makes us happy as parents. That's what makes us happy as church leaders. If you're leading a life group, what greater thing could you do than look out and see those that you're discipling walking in truth, living out what they're supposed to be knowing about and reading? When you walk in truth... Your relationships get right. You get right. The church benefits. Your marriage strengthens. Your children are blessed. You love one another. You have strength for trials and wisdom for hard questions. You are equipped for a calling that God really would like to give you because he says, you're my workmanship. I have plans for you. I want you to be equipped and move forward. You have an answer for those who ask about the hope that is in you, you have direction when you come to the crossroads of your life and you become the very unique expression of the Lord Jesus himself to a world that's looking on or to family who are looking on. Can I just say this? Healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. Things that are not healthy don't grow. If you're the same this past year as you were the year before, then you didn't grow. Are you going to be the same next year as you were this past year? That, that means you didn't grow. I want to believe that particularly April and I have what we have spiritually as a family. Let me just say it this way, and I'm not a great example for everything, but I thank God for this. Spiritually what we have, I believe, is because we focused on the spiritual things in our home. I wanted as a goal for my kids to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ with their lives. I've prayed thousands of times, <laughs> Lord, my kids are yours. I want them to love you. Before, before, when they were children, Lord, I want them to come to know you at a young age. I want them to find you worthy of their lives. I want them to live for you and serve you all the days of their life. That's still my hope and prayer 
for them. And I thank God in this, in this moment right now that they are all about that. Thank God for that. And, and, and it's important that that be the goal. If they were good at math, that's wonderful. I didn't want them making bad grades, but if they made a bad grade and they were loving and serving God, I really didn't care too much about those grades. If they played athletics of any kind, well, that's wonderful, but I really didn't care if they did or not. If they were good at a musical instrument or showed interest in that, we, we helped it along, but to be honest with you, I really didn't care much about that. I cared that they loved and wanted to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with their life. And I wanted to live with the woman that I've been living with in marriage for 35 years in such a way that they could look at us and go, that's what people in marriage who love one another, that's what it looks like. That there would be an example of that. Can I just say it this way? Those who know you the most should respect you the most, or those who know you best should respect you the most. Those who know you best should respect you the most. And it happens if you get your face in the Word of God and be there long enough that it replicates itself in your life. Make this year your prayer. Make this prayer in this new year that those who know me best can respect me the most. You know what? We, we could do this as a church. We could say, oh, we want to be running this many people. I haven't set a numerical goal for church since I was a a baby preacher <laughs> I'm not in charge of who comes to this church I want to tell everybody about Jesus invite everybody I can to come who gets saved and who comes is between God and them my focus is on your health your spiritual health if I can get you to abide with the Father John 15 we'll put the verse up you look at it the mechanics of that verse is if you will abide with him and he and you understand that the fruit is going to come from God, the vine, the Lord Jesus, through you, the branch. Fruit comes in your life by what? Abiding, being with him, being in the word of God. The fruit will come from this church if I can keep you abiding in the vine. It will just happen. It will just, in fact, if I could get all of you abiding we would never be out of a building campaign. We never would. How many thousands of people you think need to be reached in this community? Y'all give me five minutes. I'll take 10 then, all right? <laughs> Let me just say this as we just fold up here today. Practical, practical, practical. If we're going to spend time in the Word of God, it must begin with intentionality. Intentionality. Now then, let me break that down one more time. A lot of people have good intentions. I'm going to go to the gym six times a week. I'm going to eat 1,200 calories. I'm off sugar, off snacks. Well, that's great, right? Or I'll just flat out say, I'm going to lose 25 pounds. Those are our intentions. What's your plan? Amen? What's your plan? Now, all that other stuff, physical stuff, that's between you and whoever. What's your plan to be in the Word of God in a greater way this year? you got to have a plan. Let me just equip you a little bit. In the app, most of you have. I think it's under this weekend. You can go down the second thing or so. Here's some tools for the Word of God. You'll find the Read Scripture app. The Bible Project people put this out. 80% I, I, of the year I'm in this. I read from it on an app. I take my Bible, read through it. There are videos for every book in the Bible that tells you about every book in the Bible. 
Most of them are about eight minutes. Here's what you're about to read. Here's how it sits in Scripture, and it's, it's drawn out, and it's a wonderful tool. One of the finest Bible tools known to man is the Read Scripture app, the YouVersion app. You can go to it. Here's Bible reading plans. Read this for this subject. Read this to start the new year. All kinds of things are given out there. Get good devotional books, but don't just live on devotional books because devotional books are one little, one little bite of Bible and then somebody's opinion about it normally. They're helpful and they're good and they're good in commentary. I recommend them. I read from a couple of them every morning of, of my life. I, and by the way, I'd like to read those guys who've been dead about 150 years. They can't mess me up, right? I mean, it's, we know what they are. I read that stuff. Bible reading plan. What's your plan? Get a plan and begin. Begin today. Take time. Set time aside and read through it. If, you're, if you are intentional, then you're going to set some goals, right? And goals become a little uncomfortable and they're disruptive to the normal schedule of not doing anything in a plan. The last word I give you is motivation. Motivation. A lot of my responsibility is to motivate you to get in the book and to do what God asks you to do. Goal setting is a spiritual responsibility. It is a spiritual responsibility. God set goals and strategy. Our text verses started out with one of them a while ago. His goal was to make you a masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus. It was a plan and a goal he set a long time ago. A long time ago. Paul understood it. Paul had been a killer of Christians. Think of that. What a way to start in the hole. How'd you start out your walk with the Lord Jesus? Well, before I met him, I was killing Christians and destroying the church. In Philippians chapter 3, notice this, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended or to have arrived, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. I bet he'd like to forget all that, right? I want to forget all that stuff. I'm going to put my past behind me. In this new year, Pastor Joel did a great devotional this week, by the way, and on social media for us with that. Don't let your past, your failures, hang over you like a cloud. It's a new day. Put it behind you. Reaching forth unto those things which are before. Keep moving toward what? There's a goal. There's a prize. There's a high calling. There's a strategy to get there. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To be made like him is what he's saying. I want to be imprinted with the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. If anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. How I know that I'm not perfect in his image is when I open the word of God and see where I need to make adjustments. I have to have a goal and strategy to stay in the Word of God to, to move forward. Now, let me, let me give you, the, the, again, the text verse again. If you're in a life group, again, you're going to spend time with this. Ephesians 2, 8, God saved you by His what? It, it, it's, uh, you're here by His grace. When you believe, when you believe, when you put faith in Christ, He saved you in that moment. And you can't take credit for it. You can't get up to heaven and start bragging about how you got there. It was a gift he gave you. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, for none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. God wants me and wants you to be intentional and motivated about what he's doing in our lives so we can come together collectively here as a church with him as the head and we be, again, intentional and motivated about our mission that he's giving us in our community. He doesn't want you or this church to float down the lazy river of life for 2022. We'll just see how it's going to turn out. Well, we're just going to just, wherever it takes us. My goodness, don't be on the lazy river of life. You know that saying, it is what it is. I detest that saying. It is what it is. No bless God with God's help. It'll be what I kick its rear end into being. Amen? It'll be what we whip it into shape to be. It'll be what we strategize about and the goals to be set forward and to move forward in it. 
Don't take that lazy river of life attitude into all that we're doing. Please don't do that. Last year, I'm about to pray, I promise. It's been six minutes, I lied to you. <laughs> when I get thankful, Thanksgiving, we gave our report, you know, kind of this where we're at in the year. I think about this year, one of the greatest years of ministry I've ever had in my life. Moving into a new building, new campus, right at 400 people come to know Christ in a single year, 78 people baptized in this single year. And by the way, it means hundreds more need to. Next step for some of you, right? All the incredible things, financial things, the, about to finish up the capital campaign so we can start another one. All these incredible things happening in our church. You know what I did for just a moment before God rebuked me in the heart? I thought, man, how will we ever do that again? 2022 will be a letdown. It was just for a moment, and I'm telling you, I felt, I felt the shadow of God move over my heart and mind. Can we put that last verse up on the scripture or on the screen for us there again? Ladies and gentlemen, what does this say? Now all glory to God who's able through his mighty power at work within us. You know what that is? The Spirit of God taking the Word of God and replicating it in our lives. Remember, it's alive and powerful to accomplish infinitely, infinitely more than we might ask or think. How good could 2022 be? How wide do you want to open your mouth? Amen? What are you going to call on God for for 2022? Family members that need to be saved? Influence in your life to be carried out? Children to have a greater imprint on? I mean, what is it? I can't answer for you, but what is it for you? Open your mouth wide. And He is able to do infinitely more than we can even ask or think. And I'm telling you, I've got a broad imagination infinitely more than I could even ask or think. May this truly be an incredible year that tops the top for what God could do with us. But it will begin with you and I doing the work and getting in the Word of God and seeing what He has to say for us. Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. Thank you for your patience and letting me get a lot off my shoulders today. <laughs> with our heads bowed and eyes closed, let me just talk to you as Christian people first. Those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, you already knew most everything I've said today. We need to spend time in the Word of God. If you've come into agreement in your heart that God is calling you to something deeper in His Word and to have an intentionality and a plan to spend more time with Him, don't waste the grace of His Spirit moving upon your heart and life. Determine right now that you will do it. If that's you, would you slip up your hand with mine? With mine. It's most of us in the room. May God help us spend more time in His Word this year. You may put your hands out. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, what I know is I preach the Word of God to you today, which is alive and powerful. And the Spirit of God is letting you know right now that what the preacher is saying is true because it's the Word of God. God loves you. We need His salvation. You can't get to heaven, as that verse says, by being good. There's nothing good in you. There's nothing good in me. We're all sinners. God Himself is what we compare ourselves to, not to one another. God's perfect and we're very imperfect and therefore we needed a perfect substitution and God in the person of Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for your and my sin and he says if you'll call on me whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved calling on him is putting faith in him asking him to forgive you of your sins and to be your savior if you need to be saved and you've come to church maybe even for the first time uh, first time in a long time, whatever the case is, but you need to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you right now if you'll just pray this prayer behind me. You're not saved by repeating a prayer or the magic words of a prayer. A prayer is just a simple expression of what your heart desires to do. And if God is moving upon your heart, would you pray right out of your heart? You don't have to even pray out loud, just out of your heart, something like this. Dear God, 
Just pray that behind me. Dear God, I do believe that you love me. And I do believe that you, Jesus, died for me. You died for my sins. And I am a sinner. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you to be my Savior. I'm asking it by faith. I'm asking it in Jesus' name.